Hi, everybody. I'm Timothy Lewis. Uh, I run a hedge fund right now, uh, one of the most institutionally compliant hedge funds in the space um, called Ikigai Asset Management. I was a I've been a developer my whole life, and I've worked with cryptography for the last 30 years, building out uh, very secure, very expedient networks for banks. Uh, turns out the stuff that we were working on in the 90s in the cypherpunk community, which I was involved in, is uh, really popular these days. Uh, we, we created a new method and way to create intermediary list networks that we can trust and we can place these things, these crypto assets we now call them on top of that, that can signify ownership of uh, greater goods. The first one of these that most people have heard of is, is Bitcoin. Bitcoin it was a breakthrough in the way it wasn't the first crypto asset. The real first crypto asset was called eCash, and it was actually the first thing that was used to spend money on the internet uh, in 1994 uh, from a com company called DigiCash by uh, David Chom. So these things actually, we were using eCash and crypto assets on the internet before we were using credit cards. Um, but it was still a centralized organization, and, and a lot of the cipher community had a problem with this. Uh, and, and so developments continued throughout the late 90s. Uh, then you had some other internet caches like, like PayPal and Bill Points and uh, Flues and Beans over here in Europe. Uh, also, those were centralized organizations. In 2004, 2005, we had a couple big breakthroughs. One was called Reusable Proof of Works by Hal Finney. Uh, and then the second was Nick Zabo's BitGold paper that described Byzantine quorum networks. So there was this big math problem called the Byzantine Generals problem in which you couldn't trust information peer-to-peer -peer without an intermediary. And the breakthrough of the, bit, of the Bitcoin network, the Big B Bitcoin network, was that it was able to, exhibit, uh, able to exhibit Byzantine fault tolerance. And we could mathematically prove that we could transfer a ledger and items on a ledger in a trustable way through mathematics uh, to where we didn't need to trust somebody else's ledger. So really the ledgers we talk about, when you think about double entry accounting, which was the big breakthrough in banking in the 1300s in the Medici period, around the 1340s, uh, the, the Medici family created a double entry accounting and it created these bancos. These bancos were just people with tables that would come to businesses and teach you how to both account for things on the way in and things on the way out. And double entry accounting restructured all of finance, but it took a while. It wasn't immediate. In the 1340, if you came to somebody and you were trading with them on Silk Road, you brought down a piece of paper saying it signified 300 pounds of gold, they looked at you like you were crazy. And it took hundreds of years to kind of get the world adapted to this being a possibility through this infrastructure of banks. Uh, and so now we've created the possibility for triple entry accounting. And that's what, what, that, that's what these Byzantine fault tolerant networks provide. Uh, and so now, now we're, not only able going to, we're not only going to be able to create simple assets like currencies, like Bitcoin, but also other cryptographic assets, things that signify other securities uh, or, or contracts and programs that are, we're able to trust without an intermediary. And so there's many new things that are going to go on top of these networks, but it's going to take a little bit for it to be restructured. It, to me, is an inevitability. Understanding triple entry accounting and where it's going to be uh, means that, yes, it might take you know, 10, 15, 20 years beyond to reach these next subsects of people, but ultimately it's a, it's a superior technology that will allow us to get rid of a lot of the intermediaries that are involved in trade and finance. Uh, and doing so kind of without regard to borders, which is also pretty interesting. Um, this is an age that people refer to as lex cryptographia. This is the lexicon of cryptography that we are about to enter into. Um, so really, Bitcoin came out, you know, 2009, January 3rd, 2009, was uh, being capable of issuing smart contracts. Uh, but when that happened, uh, we started experimenting with other new ways of doing things, being able to issue these type of tokens. Um, and so when I talk about these type of tokens, you know, most people think of these as crypt stri strictly cryptocurrencies, and that's really inaccurate. Uh, they can represent many different things. They can represent trust, a signature, a security. Uh, they'll be able to represent different commodities, different contracts, um, and, and, and we're still developing what those things are. So it's, it, it is a confusing space. 
because everyone looks at these things like, oh, wow, these are cryptocurrencies. They're only used to uh, obfuscate the, the, your, your, your agreements with governments, and, and they're used to buy drugs on the internet. Uh, we, don't need one of the, we don't need these things. We have cash money in most of our uh, more mature uh, governments, right? But ultimately, you know, currency itself um, is, is a form of communication. And a lot of us believe in the freedom of communication and being able to, to communicate freely amongst peers however we choose to. So it's an important experiment to have a non-central bank, uh, non-sovereign financial asset and currency. Uh, so whereas Bitcoin might not be that thing, it's bringing up the conversation and it possibly could be that thing. So it is a, an exit from the greatest experiments in financial history with the quantitative easing that's been going on over the last you know, some odd, some odd time here. Uh, and so people are very interested in that now. And now understanding the technology and understanding the other things in the technology is what's important. Um, so many people over the last couple years have been involved in different things. Every time you have a new asset class, there's a lot of different scams that come out, a lot of different people that are going to try to uh, take, you know, people, uh, remove people from their capital. And so you have to be be wary and be secure and understand what these things are and they aren't. Uh, so a lot of us get to travel the world and talk to people about what they are and what they're not and hopefully what they will be. And so, you know, yesterday I was in, in New York City talking about these things in front of an audience of several hundred at, a, at an event called Consensus. Last four years I've gone over 47 different countries and, and been speaking to people about these things. And this is a collection of, of, of professionals here that have also been traveling the world, talking to people, trying to explain what these things are. Some people have different backgrounds that you'll see. This is kind of a convergence of, of finance, of technology, uh, and, and, and of uh, community movement as well, because these are, are community assets and we're gonna be able to own uh, smaller community assets that we can tokenize. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna have everyone introduce themselves a little bit about what they do, where they're from, and uh, kind of what, where they first started getting interested in the blockchain. Hi everyone, my name is Dushitahana Lukac. I'm a partner at Deal Capital Partners, we are London based, but I'm Viennese. Uh, I got interested very early. I'm also a little bit of a gamer. So when the Bitcoin started happening, um, I was um, uh, looking at it. I knew from the community something is happening. I was not aware, honestly, how big and important it is in the first couple of years. I was just keeping my eyes and ears open. And um, uh, once I recognized capacity for not only for technological innovation, but also for financial innovation, that's when my brain started buzzing. Because I've done a lots of first things in, in finance and I, I went to the out frontiers out there. So when um, things happen with the blockchain, I immediately recognized it's going to be like huge. And uh, I started looking into it. And um, as a previous panel already introduced, I've uh, been looking into both uh, cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, and naturally security tokens, because that's where the game starts. And this is where like real creativity in regulated space can happen. And that's what I do a lot. Uh, I also work with um, uh, some blockchain solutions about data. Uh, I myself invested at some moment in AI and I'm very much interested in that space and seeing how these two technologies are coming together. Um, my background is in investment banking, which is not coming as a surprise. And uh, I stay close to the money and um, I've been looking into some creative financing of a film industry and I would say that security token gives, um, opens the doors really, really wide doors for entertainment yes. industry on yeah. so many levels yeah. and, and totally new level. I believe it's going to be the same amount of innovation like slate finance arrangements when they started. I agree. And I totally believe in that. And I'm uh, more than happy to put uh, part of my tiny brain uh, to, to push at least a little bit. And um, yeah, next week I'm in Hong Kong. I'll be talking on the Security Token Summit. Beautiful. Uh, so that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gleb. Um, <coughs> David Duke. I'm a founder of a company called ITEC Capital. And from my perspective as an investor, I'm an investor. The, the, the what's happening in the market is very binary. Either it's just e either one or zero. You, you, I, I, I see a lot of people on the market talking about blockchain every day. And a year ago it was like 
hundred times more. Now it's a little bit quiet, in, thanks God. And uh, but um, very few people do have a product or service which is out working and operational. Very few of them do have anything which you can use. So <laughs> other than trade the cryptocurrency. You know, I, I would say when we look at the internet, when the internet was created, uh, it was created. Uh, it started as ARPANET, and this was in 1968. That this was created, and and now we've only had Byzantine fault tolerant networks for 10 years. So let's take 10 years out on the internet. So 1968 to 1978, uh, I would I would be very suspicious of anyone who was who who was going to claim to be an internet expert in 1978. So you know, technologies take a long time sometimes to develop. Speculators want them tomorrow, and speculators drive these great uh, fervor for, for want and need on, on a, on a, on a uh, not widely held asset, which drives prices crazy high. And then everyone leaves when it, they don't have the thing that they wanted or were promised a year later, and it goes down low. And we've been in these cycles for the last 10 years, and it's kind of, kind of mirrored that. But it's getting there. For me, the understanding triple entry accounting is that inevitability. So understanding those Byzantine quorum networks is that inevitability. But we'll get into there. Finance guys are very important in this industry. And we'll, we'll get a line to talk to them. So are, so are gamers. And we got a good, great gamer with us here today as well. Yeah. I play a lot of video games. Um, so I'm currently president of a company called Sandbox VR. Uh, we're in the virtual reality space. We, our mission is to bring a hollow deck to every neighborhood in the world. So we combine motion capture with virtual reality technology. Give everyone a virtual body. You're in there with friends. Um, we're the number one activity in TripAdvisor in both uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. Our two long largest uh, locations. Uh, yeah, and we recently announced a $68 million round from Andreessen Horowitz, uh, which is the largest amount of financing in VR since Oculus. Uh, but yeah, uh, my background is actually in gaming and virtual goods. So I used to be a head of product for a company called Zynga. we have best known for Words of Friends today. used to be known for Far Farmville and a bunch of games on Facebook. Uh, and uh, back in 08, you know, when I first got into gaming and entrepreneurship, virtual goods is, wasn't really a thing, at least in the United States, right? So a lot of people didn't understand why people would pay real dollars for fake bits that you can only see on your screen. And uh, the way I would explain it is everyone already pays for virtual goods, whether you know it or not. When you buy a designer pair of jeans, you're paying for about $90 or $900 worth of virtual goods, no matter $100 worth of actual material. Um, and you know, to me, Bitcoin is kind of like that, right? It's a shared belief in something valuable, even though it's just a bunch of bits. Uh, my exposure to Bitcoin, I currently own Telegram and Bitcoin only. Um, uh, I am probably, the story I like to tell is I bought Bitcoin at about uh, 30 cents and I sold it at a dollar and then I got back in at 3,000. <laughs> so, yeah. When it went from 30 cents to a dollar, it then also crashed back down for a period of time. Yeah. So people were all, you know, he made a smart play at the moment. And when then, when had, then the next one of the... Yeah, he was, he was a genius at the time, and then it also had gone from you know the next rise up went from went from this 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 sub dollar to thirty dollars, and then fell down to two dollars. So this stuff was this died again, but uh, it's still alive, still kicking, uh, and it's it's very interesting. We'll get back into virtual goods for sure. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew Thomas. I'm the lead architect at IBM's uh, Industry S uh, Solutions Center for Telecom and Media. So. We basically cover several areas, including AI, analytics, cloud from the public-private edge, as well as blockchain. So just a brief background on some of the blockchain projects that we've been working on from a telecom and media. Uh, you know, almost all of them will require a group of different entities, c corporations that need to come together, use the common ledger to come to a sort of agreement and consensus on what needs to be done. Simple example would be one of the er key areas we're looking at right now from a telecom perspective is around supply chain, especially with 5G and everything else coming out. Every time a new order or something has to be placed, there are multiple entities and multiple parties involved in that, from physical to virtual and other components that have to be installed, run, and monitor. How do those different parties come together, collaborate, and use blockchain to be more effective? Is that Fantastic. Well, so I'm an investment professional somehow these days, and it is my job as an investment professional to be able to discern between these types of things. I will say that in the utility token side of the world, 99.9% .9 of the things are absolute garbage and will be worth zero. But 
there are securities, and securities follow security regulation. And if you can uh, understand the the value of an underlying company, and you can, as an investment advisor, determine that that is a, a, of some value, there's there are benefits for both the company, the investors, and the later on communities and corporations to use this new technology. But it is nascent and it is new. So that, that's absolute. I agree. So yeah. uh, a bit of the education needed. Yeah. Uh, well, to be honest with you, I invested back in 2015 in crypto, so I know what I'm talking about. And now, yeah. since not everyone time, who invested in crypto in 2015 knows what they're talking about. That's for damn sure. <laughs> most, most people were just you know miscreants and, 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 and punks, and so that doesn't mean a lot of people got lucky. So you know, just because you were there early lucky didn't mean you really know what's going on. No, we, we, yeah. we know what's going on, and that's the reason why we didn't invest so far afterwards. So every time we, we were involved into the many, many deals, projects, whatever it is, uh, stock exchanges, whatever it is. But uh, to be honest, uh, I did just a few investments afterwards, just a few, because of 99.9 .9 period yep. is scam. It is. That and is, this is, yep. this is that, a big problem. Absolutely. You know, really, really, really full due diligence on anything that you're getting yourself involved with uh, uh, in, in this space because the beginning of any new, any new asset class comes full of scams. Uh, Gleb, I, I absolutely agree with you. We've seen so many bad things, and that's why we started working within the regulators. And I know lots of people, and I myself worked with some of the regulators in order to put it up front in a proper way. And just for, for the information, for example, next month we will be launching a security token network, the product, which is exactly uh, you know uh, the space with the data room and reporting and the depth of the secondary, uh, primary, secondary market. Uh, it's it's on the blockchain, and the first prerequisite is to do proper KYC, KYB, uh, otherwise you cannot even access uh, the proper information. And it's not a trading platform. We are that's mm -hmm. that's exactly just mm -hmm. the ecosystem <laughs> platform. <laughs> so I would say that that's um, y we know we know about all these problems, and that's we spent a lots of energy on changing that. This is exactly where the problem comes when you start talking the KYC language to the crypto community. This no. is what the crypto community hates because this is the decentralized community. So so this they, is this, this is anarchist uh, so, community. So, so I I disagree. Uh, I, I think I think that it, it, it has started and it did start in that in that method. This is a very libertarian, uh, very uh, the, the idea of, of and I do hope we have completely decentralized networks for the things that are important, the real things that are important, like identification and be and, and, and currency. Those are two things that I consider immediate right now that we need to go forward and we need to find ways to connect with self-sovereign identity and decentralized networks that we don't have to be involved with central governments who time and time again have put, you know, proven to, 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 to not last the, the stand of time. Uh, so we have to be looking for those things. But in this intermediary period, as we're transitioning to networks that can actually support these type of things, we have to meet regulatory guidelines. And the technology as a platform has benefits, so many benefits over trading with paper. We well, you know, I, I can go on, I, and I, I have my Series 7 since I was 18 years old. If you want to go into the history of exchanges, and you, want, and you really want to talk about securities markets in general, securities were all scams before, you know, 1910, right? People were just issuing paper, and, 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 and you were doing it kind of just without any regulatory body whatsoever. And security brokers, those weren't considered good people. Those were literally the scum. Those people did did not do good things. You know, it took massive. You know, uh, it took massive scams during the 20s and 30s for them for for at least in the United States and then many of the other countries followed suit to restructure that in a way to where it was regulated and people could trust it. And that's where we're going through. It's been totally scammy. I get it. Bitcoin's not a scam, though, and so it's a pretty amazing piece of technology. And now we're able to use Byzantine fault-tolerant networks, the blockchain, to represent things in a more secure, more transparent, more tradable manner over the Internet. And so that's just a new technology layer. And so those things, it's not there completely yet. We don't all have a radical secondary markets with a lot of liquidity. But those are coming, and you can actually create these new projects like the Slate projects. And you know, I live in I live in LA, and I work with a number of uh, uh, of different people in the in the in the in the Hollywood industry. I'm a part of two projects right now for creating issuance platforms and secondary trading platforms for securities that represent movies. And these aren't coming from just the indie films that want the $5 million because they don't have any other way to raise money. These are coming from large studios that are, that are going to 
you know, create a 5% equity block from their big blockbuster film because in the future, let's just say the word Avengers, let's just say you have an Avengers, let's say Avengers tokenizes and to create securities for 5% of their film as a marketing budget that has a bunch of people that are ravenous owners of the film and can guarantee a success for it. The next Batman that comes out, if they don't do that, and they don't include their community like that, people aren't going to get behind it. They're going to start wondering why. It's participation from the crowd and community-owned assets that this enables in a, in a more easy way. So we're not there yet. But one of the things I will touch on, given that, is the ability now, if you have this ownership of this and you're able to assign and know who your, your owners are, you can also create these virtual goods. And you can create virtual NFTs. So we'll talk a little bit about gaming and what these NFTs are. Because this is another type of asset that hadn't really kind of come up before. So if you don't mind, you know, go in a little bit about what virtual goods were, EverQuest and, and, and Ultima uh, and World of Warcraft, and then what they might be here with these newer technologies. Yeah. Uh, virtual goods are goods that aren't made of atoms, fundamentally. Right? So that chair is a real good. Um, I'll give you a real example of virtual goods. So in one of the first uh, products that I ever worked on back in 2007, uh, it was a social network where you can buy and trade icons representing people. It's called, called Friends or Sale. You're literally buying and selling people's identities on Facebook. Um, and so the idea is you can have 30 million people who are fans of Justin Bieber, but in our network, you can only have a relationship with Justin Bieber only one person can ever have a relation with Justin Bieber at a time. And that relationship is tradable with virtual currency. Um, one of the mechanics we have there is the ability to gift virtual goods, basically a picture. And so we had a picture. Our most expensive virtual good was a picture of a silver rose, which uh, people bought for 10,000 US dollars. Um, and they were a limited edition. There was about 100 of them that we ever made. Um, and you would have Saudi Arabian sheikhs who would buy them and to send them to beautiful people on Facebook. Um, so that is a virtual good. Another virtual good that I talked about is uh, any kind of luxury item that you will buy in the real world, that is 90% virtual goods, 95% probably, right? Because the cost of that is leather and is workmanship, but 95% is actually the brand. And the virtual good, all virtual goods, whether it's our silver rose that we sell on our product or when you buy a Gucci bag is fundamentally about belief. This shared belief that if you own a silver rose in our product, it is valuable because we all know it's worth $10,000. In the same way that if you buy a Louis Vuitton bag, it's valuable by virtue of being made by Louis Vuitton. And uh, the interesting thing about blockchain is that now you can have virtual goods in a completely trustless manner, right? Like, you know, it, that gets to the idea of like what property is, and we can be really philosophical about this, right? Which, you know, what does it mean to own something, right? In the real world, in with things made out of atoms, the idea of ownership is fundamentally defined at the end of the day, at the end of a barrel of a gun, right? Uh, no, maybe, maybe the microphone is like, you, you cut you off, you're done. No, here we go. Why don't we just switch it back? We're down to one mic. Right. So, you know, the, 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 yeah, when you think about a real virtual good, a real good made out of atoms, Testing. ownership is defined and uh, maintained at the barrel of a gun, right? So if someone steals your stuff, you call the police, and they will have a gun, and they will try to arrest the people and, by force, prevent people from stealing the stuff that you have, right? Um, with blockchain... That is defined by mathematics and trust and cryptography. Whoever owns a secret provably owns a thing. And I think where it gets interesting is how that mathematical virtual ownership, as we're trying to tokenize everything in the real world, how that interacts with the physical goods, right? Because that ownership is still has to be defined by the endpoint of a gun, right? And even if I say fundamentally on the blockchain I own a thing, if that thing isn't enforced in a real world by a real person, it's not real. And I think that's where it's going to get interesting over time. Just to, just to mention where that's kind of unique in this world of virtual goods with blockchains is the fact that, you know, digital goods can re be replicated. You, you, you download in an MP3, if I own an MP3 and I send you an MP3, now we both have MP3s. Using these networks, you're able to create unique 
digital goods guaranteed by that cryptographic asset. Uh, so that's where this is a new thing, and there, 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 there will be different trusted networks for different goods. But being able to come out with some things, if you, if somebody owns, say, your security for a movie, and if they own more than a hundred of the securities, they might get a golden ticket NFT, and that golden ticket NFT might actually have the real world value of being able to go to run with one of the red carpet premieres. But then you also get to hold and own that golden ticket for the life of the network. And it's pretty interesting stuff. One of the things he mentioned, he talked about uh, from the virtual good standpoint and an easy thing to, to, to migrate to or to move on to when it comes to supply chain is understanding these uh, these limited edition real world goods and understanding the idea that supply chains will need to be able to track authenticity of different things uh, along these networks so you can so you can verify and, and, and make sure that your Louis Vuitton bag is actually a Louis Vuitton bag uh, and you can you can see that where this was where it was processed one day you might not even know who was the seamstress for whomever stitched your bag because we'll be able to have that defined really well down to the end um, so when you look at supply chain solutions and solutions for the different players in the financing of a movie or the creation of a movie there's also a solution there and so IBM's working on a lot of those those solutions so if you wouldn't mind go over a little bit of the type of solutions that you might expect to see on a, both on the supply chain and then also why you would want, you know, why wouldn't people that were all working on the same project just work on the same database? And why it's important that we have this uh, uh, public intermediary or permissioned intermediary uh, so or as a network rather than as an owned property by any one of those partners. Thank you. Certainly, great question. So. The problem with the database is you've got a single database and you've got multiple parties that have to deal with it. These parties could be distributed all over the place. If that database goes down, there are issues. How can you trust who's going to manage that database? Is, you know, There's this whole idea about once you put something in there, who has the authority to change it? How do you keep track of, of all the different records and everything that happens? And that's where blockchain becomes very useful from a supply chain perspective, whether it be a physical supply chain or a digital supply chain. So from a digital supply chain, which since most of us are he here are from a media perspective, what blockchain is able to do is when a piece of content is made available, it goes through multiple phases. If this piece of content happens to be within your enterprise and you have complete control over it, there's probably no need for blockchain. But the moment that piece of content is now going to be touched by multiple parties, you would like to know who touched that. Let's suppose there's a piece of, there's a monetary value to that. Someone's going to take a cut off that, okay, in, in your full end-to-end -to -end supply chain. Who took the cut off that, off that specific uh, value of that? So, so for example, if, if an advertiser wants to publish something, there'll be a whole set of intermediate parties in between every party will take a cut off it. We're, you don't have that transparency if you just put it into a, in, into a simple database. But with blockchain, you can keep track of all of that. Blockchain has a concept of provenance, which means I know where this piece of asset was, whether it be digital or physical, and then it's able to keep track of all of that. Not only is blockchain able to do that, once someone writes something to a blockchain, it's considered to be immutable because you have a consensus between the different parties that yes, this is how it should be done. We have come up with a consensus model and blockchain is able to implement that consensus model using smart contract. And then once we, we have that consensus uh, in place, yeah, that piece of, uh, of, of, of asset or whatever related to it that's written in blockchain is what we would consider immutable. It's written, it is done, we've agreed to it, let's move on to the next stage. Implementing all of that with the d database, et cetera, gets to be a whole lot more complex. And of course, we can get into security and trust and a whole other areas. Blockchain provides all of this. Well, that's, that's the thing. It's no longer necessary to trust people. And that's fantastic. I'd rather trust the, the systems that uh, can provide this Byzantine fault tolerance. So if you weren't confused before this about the industry, hopefully you're more confused now. Uh, we're going to try to answer a couple questions. So if anyone has any questions for anyone, please raise your hand. And let's, uh, let's try to get you a mic. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pascal. I'm from the South African sales and distribution and production company. We do film and television production and we usually send screeners and things via Vimeo to people and try to put a watermark on and a password, blah. How could I now offer a blockchain solution to, to the same client? So say, I've got a copy, you could access to it, but you could never have it. That's how I understand it. How, how could I do that now? Is there a practical way, a platform, a software? Do they need to have blockchain on their machine to do it? Uh, you know, ultimately, those deeper solutions, I don't think, really have been fully vetted out yet. You know, you will have the ability likely to, the only way you can access or sign a file will be with uh, a cryptographic key. In some in some method, you know the the file them the file itself might be encrypted onto IPFS or uh, no no there is we can do files right now it's just not being used in the movie industry yeah. right so again it's a, it's a there there are hundreds of years that it took to rebuild the financial system during the Medici period and people are expecting this to be done in a year like it's not building out the internet was tough um, I I think I can pretty conclusively say that will never happen you will never be able to send something securely. Um, because at the end of the day, as long as there is an output where someone can, can screen it, then I can take my mobile phone and make another recording. Sure, it. but having a direct digital and having the access to that direct digital file will 100% be there. That's Correct. the only way we're gonna stop deep fakes. And so this idea of, that's where it actually gets into more of this conscious choice of understanding how we're gonna be able to describe and be able to, to understand what's real and what's not is by the guarantee that this file hasn't been adjusted or, or hasn't been changed by someone along the way. And having access and ownership to that file, you'll be able to prove. So you'll know whether or not you're viewing a video of Barack Obama and it's actually Barack Obama because he signed the file too versus you looking at a file with Barack talking to Putin and, and talking about something crazy, which 99% of the world won't, won't, won't be able to judge whether or not it's true or not. So those solutions are coming. You will not be able to fully rectify people being able to copy movies. I mean, you know, people have been pirates for the for a long time. They continue we will continue to be so. And if you're willing to watch a movie in the mobile screen from someone having videoed it off of the di the digital editing machine, that's still going to be there. But high quality your high quality files and systems for guaranteeing those high quality files and the ownership of them and the access of them are coming and you can actually do that right now with IPFS. So as it, it will get adjusted into some of your other, the, 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 the typical equipment that especially the movie industry works with and works on, it will, and it, it will be in those platforms. I'd give it five years, particularly because of deep fakes, that's going to have to happen. So a lot of people are working on that solution specifically for that because the world's in trouble if we can't tell what's real or what's not on video. Oh, cool, any other questions? IMF. Yeah, so people are working on these protocol standards for sure, and, and, and yeah, it, takes a, a, it takes a while for those protocol it, standards it, it, to develop. Exactly. So the, the key word is the protocol. So the protocol has to be adopted by the by, by the users, and then it takes time, probably five years, probably less. Uh, but when the users and particular counterparties of the film production studios yes. will actually adopt the protocol, yes. understand the protocol, Correct. and this is a now it's a different case. It's nothing to do with the technology. It's just no. About that is one hundred percent to do with the technology because it's the technology, the cryptographic network that provided that ability for you to do so. And they'll likely be on permission networks. It probably won't be on public networks, but that doesn't change the technology and what it is and the possibility and what you have to look for as it, both an investor and as a user of these networks. So yeah, it's not the public Ethereum blockchain, likely, but it might be Hyperledger that everybody runs off of for IBM but they're still working in the development of those standards right now. This is a couple years, you know, it took a long time to build the internet because we didn't have the internet. Now we've got the internet. Things are gonna rapidly accelerate and, and solutions are rapidly coming through. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree, that's why I'm sitting here actually. So, but, <laughs> but again, uh, when it comes to the returns, it's, it's still a time and it's still a matter to prove that returns are there. So that's why, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's exactly. Yep. So. I mean, the, the, there is a legacy system, so it's not going to be switched on and off. Uh, we've seen that, for example, with uh, identity checks for uh, banking accounts. I mean, in, in that sense, no one believed that the banks would go blockchain. They did. 
and uh, because it makes sense uh, and it's not easy. Uh, also GDPR issues. I mean, you always, when you start doing something, you come across, and that's why moving from a legacy system to fully functional new system, it does take time, and we don't even know all the hurdles we're going to meet on that road. And that bridge has to be crossed when we come to there. Well, thank you everyone for attending, okay. and thank you all for talking. Appreciate it.